Hello and welcome to the DSR Daily. I'm David Rothkoff, joined by Riley Fessler. How are you, Riley? Pretty good. It's been a long time. I've missed the past couple of days. Uh, uh, I know you've missed me. Have you? Sure. More than anything. More than... Okay, that sounded a little sarcastic. A little (laughs) over the top. That was, of course, Minna Stein. How are you, Minna? I'm doing well. I wish it was a little sunnier out, but... You know? I'm I've had it, you know, three or four days of grayness in a row. I feel like I live in like northern England. It's gross. Yeah, I'm over it as well. I am ready for it to be summer again. But it won't be for a while. Just guess we'll have to wait for that. Well, while we're waiting, Riley, maybe you have a, a top story from the day. Yes. Hezbollah escalated its attacks on Israel by firing dozens of projectiles, including a missile aimed at Tel Aviv, which was intercepted by the Israeli military. This marks Hezbollah's deepest strikes into Israel amidst rising tensions in the region. The militant group claimed to target Israel's Mossad intelligence agency in retaliation for the assassinations of its commanders and a recent bombing that killed civilians. In response, Israel launched airstrikes on Hezbollah positions in Lebanon killing several people, while cross-border rocket fire and heavy bombardment have displaced thousands. The situation continues to raise concerns of an all-out war as both sides engage in increasingly destructive exchanges. You know, there's this expression that the Israelis were using at the beginning and that some Americans were actually mouthing, which was escalate in order to de-escalate, which, you know, as... uh, uh, our friend Alon Pinkus said on Twitter, is like saying fucking for virginity. Um, and uh, I, that was a joke, but neither of you guys are amused by that. But that was what Alon Pinkus, who's an Israeli, actually said. Uh, and so it's a it's a, a really kind of uh, crazy thought that if you keep attacking people and firing rockets at them, that they're going to not do the same back at you. The big difference, of course, or differences between the war on Israel's north and that in uh, Gaza is, A, Hezbollah is much, much bigger and better armed than Hamas. They have tens, perhaps hundreds of thousands of missiles, but some of the missiles that they have, unlike the Hamas missiles, are not these small things that are just a step or two above fireworks. Um, that cause very little damage. A number of the the Hezbollah missiles are guided precision missiles. They're very serious weapons. <laughs> Secondly, uh, of course, there's um, a much greater uh, a, a total number of people in Lebanon, and there are people on both sides of the border affected by this thing. Um, and third, of course, this could trigger regional war in a way the other thing might not. Uh, and Right now, it seems to be slowly ratcheting up, even though um, Hezbollah and the Iranians have been careful to say that they did not want it to do so. Um, uh, it's uh, the, the Netanyahu playbook to find military action to distract from political problems at home. Uh, and while that sounds extremely cynical, I've talked to a lot of Israelis and they fear that's the case. Uh, and a number of critique that's currently being levied and at the Israelis is that they don't have a strategy. They don't know what they're trying to achieve. They're not going to eliminate Hezbollah. They're not going to eliminate the threat. If they're not going to do either, what are they going to do? They've eliminated a number of Hezbollah leaders. Uh, but the question becomes, are they replaced? How is the organization um, viable? And I don't think anybody believes that you know there will not be an a viable Hezbollah at the end of this. So uh, we watch uh, with our hearts and our throats a bit, but uh, as of right now, this bad story is getting worse. Bennett? On Tuesday, Missouri executed Marcellus Williams, who maintained his innocence in a 1998 murder case that faced significant opposition. His conviction was based largely on unreliable witness testimonies, and he was garnered 
and he garnered over a million signatures in a petition against his execution. Despite concerns raised by prosecutors and civil rights organizations, Missouri Governor Mike Parson upheld the execution, stating the legal system found no credible claims of innocence. Protests erupted across the state, highlighting ongoing issues of systematic bias in capital punishment cases. This is a heartbreaking story, um, because one of the things you did not mention was that there was DNA evidence that very well may have exonerated him. Uh, the prosecutor in the case did not want to go through with the death penalty for that reason. Um, but the governor, and then subsequently the six extreme right-wing justices in the United States Supreme Court um, felt that, you know, going ahead with the case was more important than justice. And uh, there was, as a result, this man um, uh, was murdered yesterday by the state. The death penalty is a terrible idea. It doesn't exist in civilized countries. Um, one of the reasons it doesn't exist is the immorality of it. The other reason it doesn't exist is that governments make mistakes. And this is uh, an example of that, a deeply tragic one. Um, and when you understand that, for example, this is the same governor that, you know, um, gave a pardon to those two right wingers who pulled out guns during the the, the BLM riots and stood on their lawn pointing guns at passersby, um, you, you realize this was the most cynical kind of politics, but also of the darkest kind, right? Because somebody, somebody actually died. It's irreversible. Just, just an unspeakable tragedy and miscarriage of justice. Riley. A Senate committee investigating the July 13th shooting at a Donald Trump rally in Butler, Pennsylvania, has recommended that Congress reassess the Secret Service's budget and security protocols, emphasizing the need to provide protection based on threats, not just office status. The committee's 94-page report highlights security lapses that allowed a gunman to fire shots, resulting in one death and several injuries. The report criticized the agency's operational failures, including poor communication and insufficient resources, such as the lack of a counter surveillance unit and malfunctioning radios. While the Secret Service seeks a budget increase, lawmakers are divided on how much funding would address the agency's shortcomings. There are a lot of problems at the Secret Service. Uh, you know, getting enough resources to protect political candidates uh, is certainly one of them. Uh, but I do point out that the Secret Service seemed to um, be complicit in some of the events that happened on, in and around January 6th. You'll recall that all their records mysteriously disappeared um, that there were folks on the Secret Service who felt their allegiance was more to Trump than to the country. Uh, and that that particular scandal never got dived into uh, in, in the way that, um, you know, these near miss shootings have been. Uh, so and there have been books written about this. This is a this is a, a, a problem that remains unfixed. And this is an agency that is broken by politics um, as much as anything else. And by the way, I was talking to somebody who's got a lot of experience in this area yesterday. Uh, that's true of a lot of police agencies in the United States. Well, speaking of January 6th, House Speaker Mike Johnson sparked controversy by stating that the House will adhere to standard procedures for certifying the 2024 presidential results if the election is deemed, quote, free, fair, and safe. This statement has raised concerns among House Democrats who fear that a Republican-controlled House might challenge a potential Kamala Harris victory on January 6th, 2025. 
Democratic leaders are closely monitoring the situation with House Minority Leader Hakeem Jeffries preparing for the certification process amid worries about election integrity. While some Republicans defend Johnson's comments as appropriate, Democrats criticize him for potentially undermining confidence in the electoral system. <laughs> oh, potentially undermining I mean, what he said, you know, you, as the way you read it, I was waiting for you to hit the if really hard. Um, because, you know, essentially what he said was uh, that they're going to be a problem because Trump is for sure going to say the system was not fair if he loses. Uh, and there's going to be this issue within the Republican Party and some of the far right, uh, it, 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 perhaps everybody, but certainly some on the far right are just going to blindly follow whatever Trump says. There will be protests. There will be issues. There will be challenges to election results. Um, the only way that we can come somewhat closer to avoiding this or, or or feeling confident this won't happen is if the Kamala Harris is very, very big and her margin is, uh, particularly in the Electoral College, is not one that can be overturned. That means not just winning Pennsylvania, Michigan, Wisconsin, and the one remaining district in, in Nebraska, for example. It, it also means winning North Carolina, maybe winning Arizona, having a state or two that could go either way um, so that, you know, people realize that even with all of this, they, that there is no, there is no path to reversing the, the, the direction, which is why, you know, if you care about avoiding this, the thing you've got to do wherever you are is make sure that you vote, vote early, get other people out, get them to vote early, make sure that, uh, you know, in your area, they're the right number of lawyers and people monitoring the process to ensure that it can all be proven. Uh, but I'm afraid, you know, January 6th may have been a precedent where uh, essentially we, uh, we won't have peaceful transitions of power anymore. We will have protracted legal battles. Indeed, it may not be January 6th that was the president, maybe Bush v. Gore. Um, but so far, the 21st century has not been a great one for U.S. democracy. Riley? Well, I chose this last story to highlight a potential business opportunity for us at Deep State Radio because a Houston bankruptcy judge ruled that assets from Alex Jones's InfoWars empire will be auctioned in mid-November to help pay the defamation awards he owes to the families of Sandy Hook shooting victims. The auction will include InfoWars' website, social media accounts, and other business assets. Jones, who spread false claims about the 2012... Jeez. Jones, who spread false claims that the 2012 Sandy Hook shooting was a hoax, has been ordered to pay over $1.4 billion in damages. However, his assets are worth less than $10 million, Leaning, meaning that the families will likely see only a small fraction of the awarded damages. The families are divided on how to best pursue compensation, with some favoring the auction and others preferring a settlement tied to Jones's future income. Well, that's a great idea, Riley. It's a really good idea. We go, we buy InfoWars, we rename everything InfoWars, which, by the way, is not not that much better than deep state radio, I must say. <laughs> um, uh, uh, but, uh, you know, I, I, I think we'll probably stick with what we've got um, uh, for a number of reasons. Uh, and with, uh, you know, respect to the families that have had to deal with the craziness and the hurt of this horrible guy. You know, I was on InfoWars once. Um, I know this may come as a shock to you. Minna's looking a little nauseous. As I'm I very it. shocked. But, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, but I once wrote a book called Superclass. It was about sort of the richest, most powerful people in the world. Uh, and so some, you know, genius at InfoWars, not having read the book, immediately assumed that it was like, you know, conspiracy theories about how the rich <laughs> control our lives and have planted little... Um, receivers in our brains. And so I get on and they were like, so Infowar, this is Alex Jones, you know, and he's kind of like, so, uh, D, uh, super class, um, 
you know, the, the Rockefellers and the Rothschilds control everything, don't they? And I was like, uh, no, no, they don't. <laughs> um, and then it was like, well, there's certainly a conspiracy among the rich to control our thoughts and our lives and blah, 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 blah. And I was like, uh, no. <laughs> and he was like, well, what's this with your book? But like, what's your book about? And I was like, well, I talk about inequality of wealth in the, in the world. I do say that there is inequality of power as a result of that. But, uh, you know, I, I have a whole chapter devoted to debunking conspiracy theories. <laughs> and he said, well, you worked for Henry Kissinger. You are a member of the Council on Foreign Relations. Why should we believe you? You're part of the global conspiracy. And I was like, okay, thanks very much. <laughs> Thank you for your time. Uh, and there, and, and off I went. But it was not my only brush with right-wing media, because I, a long time ago, would accept invitations from Fox Media before they went completely cuckoo for Cocoa Puffs. Um and would sometimes get that on there, but it was extreme. And, uh, you know, this guy, this guy earned his bankruptcy and uh, I only wish the well for the people he made suffer. Um, uh, lots more going on today because we're in campaign season. I think it's interesting. There were no stories out of Unga yesterday, even though the president spoke there, Riley. You know, we could have talked about that, except you're absolutely right. There was really nothing newsworthy about his remarks um, or any of the other remarks that were taking place there. Um, uh, no progress will be made on Ukraine there. No progress will be made on the war in uh, is or the wars on Israel's borders. No progress will be made on the crisis in Sudan, which is getting worse all the time. Um, uh, and, uh, a lot of the people who were there are leaving now as we get deeper into the week. Um, and we will return directly to those stories and to the campaign, um, which remains close. Although again, there've been a couple semi-encouraging polls for the vice president. Uh, I've got an article coming out a little later today, uh, in Haaretz, the large Israeli newspaper talking about uh, Trump's anti-Semitism and why it's for American Jews. There's no real choice between Trump and Harris. She's a good candidate. He's a terrible one. Um, I, I know that's a shocker that I've come to that conclusion, but I, I, I'm I, shocked. I know. I know. So I'm glad you're sitting down. You are sitting down there, right? You're not, that's not standing. I am sitting down. Yeah. yeah. Um, if I but, was standing, I would have fallen over. Uh, that's true. We would have heard the thud. Um, you know, speaking of standing, I can I can give you a little bit of news off of that. For the first time in many election cycles, the vice presidential debate, which will take place next Tuesday on October 1st, will be done standing up instead of sitting down. The past few vice presidential debates have been sitting down, but next week's will be standing up. Um, I'm so, absolutely giddy over this debate, and you've just given me one more reason to be excited. You are, you know, I'm so glad you work for us because you are the biggest nerd on the planet Earth. <laughs> In fact, we should get you a t shirt. You should, we, we, <laughs> we should get you a t shirt. Um, I mean, a particular kind of nerd. You're not like a Super Mario Kart nerd or, mm -hmm. uh, you know, Dungeons and Dragons nerd, which is... Right. I'm better rock. than those nerds. Those nerds are lower nerds. <laughs> That's a lower... We should, in fact, do an encyclopedia of nerds or in a nerd hierarchy. Right. Because then when Riley talks about, you know, his time playing Dungeons and Dragons in high school, um, we would know where he fit into it, right? I know. Surprisingly, as nerdy as I am, I've actually never played Dungeons and Dragons in my life. What's the nerdiest thing you've ever done, Riley? Um, I don't know. I mean, I play video games. Yeah. Any, any you get really addicted to? And um, talk to your friends about all the time? Worlds yeah, of big, Warcraft? I'm a big fan of the Witcher franchise. Uh, okay, the books see? and games. Not the show, though. The show is bad. Uh, see what I'm saying? There is a lower level, but I actually come, 
I actually come from the lowest level of nerds. Um, Which is? Theater kids. Oh, yeah. Mm. yeah. <laughs> I fall into that category as well. <laughs> Those so. in glass houses. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, no, the, it's the worst. And I don't even like them. You know, you watch, you know, you watch them when they like get on stage. Like, you know, sometimes that theater, a, an unregenerate theater kid will become a big time actor. And it's, it's embarrassing. The, 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 the prime example of this in my mind is Anne Hathaway, um, who's, who's just a theater nerd. She's just like everybody else in these things. And, Loves to be that dramatic, and you know, Anna Kendrick is another example of that. Um, I'm sure we we can think of others, but oh my God, I can't I can't stand thinking that I succumb to it. But uh, we have to remember that when I was in high school, go ahead, say it, Riley. There were no video games, <laughs> so I couldn't. <laughs> I couldn't. I couldn't go down that path. You, you had uh, your one nerdy outlet. You yeah, had to take it. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I did take computer science, which made me pretty nerdy, and I was into the kind of stuff that um, men is in, you know, like sort of political nerdiness and academic nerdiness, you know. Um, but uh, you know, I, like I feel like I went to Columbia University because there had been riots there, and I thought, oh, that's cool. I, I like, I like going to a school with a history of big public demonstrations. That's what I mean. Columbia's a pretty good school, but the, what I was drawn to was the history of public demonstrations. So, I don't know. As we know, the listeners to the Deep State radio podcasts and the DSR network are, as we affectionately refer to them, nerds. Because they're listening to podcasts about public policy, foreign policy, national security policy, intelligence, economics. Um, I mean, we're all going to die radio. It's like, oh, yeah, let's, let's talk about the nonproliferation treaty. And yet there they are. Not just nerds, but the nerds who control the world. Uh, and that's where you come to DSR. Because this is where you encounter the other nerds who control the world. Not the three of us, but some of the people who listen. Uh, all right. Uh, nice to talk to you this morning. Uh, nice to see you. Be back here. See you again tomorrow. Until then, thank you, Riley. Thank you, Minnie, Minna. And thank you, everybody, for listening. Bye-bye.